Hello there. A little bit of a sunburn. <laughs> um, one of the difficult things that uh, I encounter and uh, try to explain the conjugate geometry of the universe is getting people to uh, visually picture within their mind's eye the three-dimensional geometry of the conjugate pair of the universe, that is respectively the hyperboloid and the torus. The hyperboloid, of course, is an hourglass shape, yes? And the negative image of the hourglass is a torus or a donut shape. These two are the negative images of one another, but together they form a holos or a unity, a one. And that one, of course, is the conjugate pair, magnetism and dielectricity. That is centrifugal divergence, which is representative of magnetism and centripetal convergence, which of course is a hyperboloid, which is representative of counter space, zero point energy of dielectricity a move towards increasing inertia and acceleration, which of course is opposite of a force. There's no distinction between so-called gravity and that of electrostatics. You know, when you'd open up a box and the little styrofoam beads would stick to your hand as well, that's uh, electrostatics. There's no distinction between that and gravity. They're both one and the same thing. Human beings like to make concepts. I actually drew on this hourglass and I'll actually rotate it very slowly here a three-dimensional force vector. You see how it actually corkscrews around? Now, the 3D S-curve of force vector, this is the exterior geometry of the hyperboloid. A force vector, of course, is uh, the uh, force vector of magnetism. Of course, this uh, exterior geometry of the hyperboloid is also, too, the interior geometry of the torus. If you actually look at this hourglass shape, and you take the negative image of it, it's a torus or a donut. A negative image of a torus is this, the hyperboloid. A force vector cannot be two-dimensional, rather three-dimensional, likewise a torsional 3D force vector, i.e. magnetism, necessitates, the Greeks call this term anake, they also too called it tolma. We use the word necessity, but that's really kind of a crude word, but it necessitates the toroidal geometry. Nature's torus is merely a complete 3D torsional representation of fundamental force itself, i.e. magnetism. Now, I know you can't see both ends of this at the same time, but the actual force vectors are pointing 180 degrees opposite of one another. Yeah. This force vector is pointing this way, and I know you can't see the top, but this uh, force vector over here is pointing this way, so pointing this way and pointing this way. This geomagnetic precessional torque, also too called the Lamour frequency, necessitates that lag is set up, yes? This is also too the reason for the Earth's precession, as the Earth actually precesses after X number of tens of thousands of years. Um, said torsion, of course, extrapolates out the phase disparity and, of course, uh, geomagnetic precession, this uh, precessional torque. This Lamour frequency, or torque, sorry, you scratch when you get sunburn. <laughs> I apologize for that. I did a lot of walking on the beach in the sun today. This Lamour frequency, of course, is the hysteresis of the ether. Yes? The hysteresis of the ether. Um, nature's torus is merely a complete 3D torsional representation of fundamental force itself, i.e. magnetism. That's all Mother Nature works in. She works in pressure mediation, force in motion, inertia and acceleration, centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence. And of course, I know this is a glass hourglass. You know, we have sand pouring through the hourglass. This is also, too, an interesting representation of time. Right here, we actually have counter space. We also, too, have around it, ringing around it, we have the plane of inertia. Up here, we have the passage of time, which we can see, and down here, we can see the passage of time. But right here, if this were infinitely small, and of course, it's not infinitely small, since it's an hourglass, and there's a little beaded tube here, time doesn't exist. Time is only a measure of the passage of magnitudes. Right here, there is no time. Time cannot be measured. We can measure time up here and we can measure time down here as magnitudes, even though these are little grains of sand, pass from one end to the next, yes? We can measure this and we can measure this, but we can't measure this. 
the goal of all transcendence is actually right here. This is counter space. People use words like zero point energy, subspace. I don't care what stupid human beings conceptualize this as, but it's the nexus before all becoming. You know, it's the substrate before manifestation. All human beings experience the universe through this nexus. And this, of course, is an empirical nexus, the black of the eyes, the holes in your ear, the holes in your nose, the various other orifices which you appear in this universe through which you speak to and speak from. And uh, here is no time. This is the plane of inertia right here. There's no time here. Time is not a thing. Every ancient culture said time is the number four. Yes, that's the reason also, too, why four is not found within the first five digits of the Fibonacci sequence, which are one, one, two, three, five, one, one, two, three, five. Anyway, if you could actually see the three-dimensional force vector. See, Mother Nature doesn't work in a two-dimensional force vector. You can't have a force vector that's two-dimensional. The most fundamental simplex force vector necessitatively is a torsional three-dimensional force vector, which is the exterior geometry of the hyperboloid, or the hourglass shape, or, respectively, the interior geometry of a torus. So it doesn't matter if it's the interior geometry of a torus or the exterior geometry of a hyperboloid, we actually have this three-dimensional force vector. This is Mother Nature's fundamental force vector. Also, too, that fundamental force vector the Greeks discovered in my discovery in Plato's Republic 509 to 511, the divided line section, extrapolates out, too, as the exterior, excuse me, the extrinsic attribute of the absolute, principle and attribute. Uh, there is no prima causa or original sin or first cause or asking how or whence, why, um, first manifestation. Those questions are completely irrelevant and redundant when it pertains to Platinian or even Greek monism or Indian monism, excuse me for that matter. There is no distinction, so. I don't know if you can see both ends at the same time, but you kind of can. You can see the three-dimensional force vector. You could think about it in your head by me using this glass hourglass as a demonstration, so. I hope that made things a little bit clearer, but this is on this Sharpie drawing on this glass hourglass, a three-dimensional force vector. Yes? A three-dimensional force vector is really nothing more difficult than making an, an S, like making an S out of a piece of wire and bending each end inverse to the other end. It's just a three-dimensional force vector. And that's the force of motion, inertia, and acceleration, pressure mediation that defines the conjugate geometry of the entire universe, magnetism and dielectricity, because magnetism is the dielectric field. Between which everything passes, rises and falls, at which we have time, but right here, there is no time. Before time, non-Cartesian ultimate reality, but out here, we have phase disparity. Out here, we have time. Of course, human beings being empirical creatures, we live in a sea of time, obviously necessitatively so. We think time is real, but time is not real at all. Time doesn't even exist, ultimately. So, I hope that made things a little bit clearer with this little simplex demonstration, and have a lovely day.